Hello, students. All right. If you haven't been listening to my videos till this point, now is the time to start for real. Okay. What we're getting into in the next um, couple weeks is a really uh, significant field, uh, subfield in the discipline of psychology called behaviorism. Behaviorists believe that free will is a myth. They believe that everything about each of us is shaped by nurture. It's shaped by your environment. That doesn't mean it gives you free will. What it means is, and, and sometimes they demonstrate this in class with a, a chunk of Play-Doh, it means that all of the forces that work on us externally are what going, what is going to shape us or what are going to shape us into the person that we become. John Watson was an early behaviorist, and I'm not going to read this quote to you, but what he really truly believed, as do many be, strict behaviorists believe, is that you can train anybody to be anything that you want, provided you use the correct tools of behaviorism. So that little tiny baby there has no predispositions in their mind, but rather he or she will be completely shaped by external forces. So learning, when we talk about learning in this concept, again, it's what's called the behaviorist model, and it is highly deterministic and highly based on the notion of nurture or your environment. Learning in this context is uh, defined as an enduring change in behavior brought about by experience with the environment. The focus on this unit of learning is on observable behavior, what you can see. It's not so much about learning cognitive material or information, it's about learning how to behave. So a couple of words that you just need to know as a matter of a definition for this unit is, first of all, stimulus. This is anything one can respond to. Hey, Jack, how are you? That's a stimulus. Okay, it's something that you can respond to. My asking the question was a stimulus. The response is the behavior or reaction that you have in response to the stimulus. Now, if I got, you know, hit by a ball in my face, I'll go, ouch. Okay, that's reflexive. That's natural. On the other hand, if someone said, hey, Mrs. Mathers, how are you today? And I say, I'm fine, thank you, how are you? That is something that I've learned to respond to in a polite way to somebody who says or asks me how I am. So um, we're gonna begin today with a look at a movie um, scene from the movie Sea Biscuit. Now this is actually a picture of the horse Sea Biscuit. Sea Biscuit was a race horse in the 1930s. He was the underdog. There was a, a, a big horse named War Admiral that was being um, put up against Sea Biscuit, and everyone wanted Sea Biscuit to win because he was the underdog. Who doesn't love a good underdog story? So we're going to watch a short scene here from what uh, about what the trainers decide they need to do with Sea Biscuit. We gotta get to the lead. Biscuit never goes to the lead. I know, but we got to teach him to break first. If that monster shakes loose, we'll never catch him. What, retrain him? We got two weeks. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh... We'd like to buy your bell. They didn't tell me you were coming. Oh, probably just an oversight. Oh, you want me to turn on some lights or something? No. no. No? Okay. It's a predatory response. If I just brush it past his flank, he'll bolt. We just want to teach him to do it with the bell. How far do you want me to take him? To 100 feet. Just so he learns to break first. Okay. Got it. You ready? Ready. Mm. All right, 
Here we go. Okay, so what we see in this film clip is a great example of classical conditioning. Classical conditioning occurs when we pair two stimuli. So let's think about this for a second. There were two things that the horse could respond to and see if you can think of what those are. Okay, so if you think about it, um, you hopefully came up with the bell, the whip. Okay, so two stimuli. So I'm going to begin by uh, giving you the terms. And at first, this is going to seem a little bit um, difficult for some people, um, a little bit wordy, a lot of terminology, but with practice, it will come pretty naturally. So first of all, we have a UCS or an unconditioned stimulus. This is something that evokes a natural or reflexive response. Again, ask yourself what the UCS was in this short film clip. What did Seabiscuit respond naturally, and any horse for that matter? And he said it was the whip on the flank. So the whip on the flank is going to be the unconditioned stimulus. Then he said that it, he will bolt. That's an unconditioned response. That's a, the naturally occurring reflexive response that a horse has to a whip on the flank. Now, their ultimate goal, keep in mind, and, and I didn't really explain this before, but um, War Admiral was a horse that would go in the lead and stay in the lead. And if you've watched horse races before, there's some horses that like to just kind of be right behind till the very end, and then they, they run to the lead. And that's what Seabiscuit was. He was the one that would go to the lead at the very end. But in this case, because of War Admiral's strength, they knew that they needed to get Seabiscuit to bolt straight out of the, the gate and to keep that lead. So this is why they were doing this kind of training with him. So what they did then is they took the neutral stimulus. The neutral stimulus in this case is one that doesn't have a natural response, and that's a bell. And they paired it. In other words, they presented it at the same time or just prior to the UCS. And by doing this, they learn to predict that the sound of the bell predicts that the, the whip is going to come and then, it, then the horse is going to bolt naturally. So that's the learning that occurs here. So the neutral stimulus, remember, presented at the same time or slightly before the UCS. It will be called the conditioned stimulus after learning occurs. So you notice that they did the pairing about four or five times, and then they just threw the whip to the side, and Seabiscuit was able to run at the sound of the bell alone. So Seabiscuit had learned that the bell predicts the, uh, the whip, okay? So now we'll call it a conditioned stimulus. The conditioned response then is the response we make to the conditioned stimulus alone, after the learning has occurred. So now Seabiscuit is going to run, and in this case, the conditioned response is going to be the same as the unconditioned response. Now, sometimes it will be slightly different, and we'll talk about examples um, where they're slightly different in class, but um, they're, like I said, they're the same or similar. So now let's like, take a look at Ivan Pavlov's work. He is actually the pioneer of classical conditioning, and he is known for his work with dogs. Most people actually have heard of Pavlov and his dogs. And I'm going to go back to some um, video that shows how Pavlov worked with his dogs. It's actually archival video of, of Ivan Pavlov himself and his dogs. Theology and medicine in 1904. As this original footage shows, Pavlov was initially interested in digestion and the action of the salivary glands. By diverting the saliva of dogs into test tubes, he could precisely measure if and how much they salivated during digestion. 
When food was presented, the dog salivated quickly and inherited salivary reflex. But over repeated testings, a strange thing happened. The dog salivated before contact with the food. Just the sight of the food was enough to stimulate their drooling. Then, just seeing the food dish, or even hearing the footsteps of Pavlov or his assistants, was enough to trigger this built-in reflex. What was going on to elicit this response? Pavlov decided to find out by systematically varying the stimuli and measuring the dog's reaction. Metronomes, lights, and bells were all used as stimuli, and they all worked as stand-ins for the food. What mattered was not the kind of stimulus that was used, but the fact that it reliably signaled that food was on the way. Pavlov had discovered a fundamental type of learning called classical conditioning. An original stimulus elicits an automatic unlearned response. Both stimulus and response happen naturally. They are unconditioned. Then a second, neutral stimulus that never elicits the unconditioned response by itself is introduced just before the presentation of the original stimulus. If the neutral or signaling stimulus is presented alone and a response occurs as if the original stimulus were still there, we say that conditioning has taken place. The arbitrary neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. The reverse is also true. Pavlov and others studied the extinction over time of such conditioned responses. When the subject learns that the conditioned stimulus no longer signals a desired event, the acquisition process is reversed as the learned connection is gradually weakened. Pavlov's work and the work of those who followed him led to a remarkable conclusion, and that is any stimulus an organism can perceive is capable of eliciting any reaction the organism is capable of making. This means that virtually any sound, sight, or smell can influence the way our muscles tense or relax, our moods fluctuate, or even the way our attitudes are formed. For instance, if I say, relax, and then do this, you're going to be startled and upset. After five or six pairings of relax, just saying the word relax is going to generate a negative response rather than its usual learned reaction. All right, so that is Dr. Phil Zimbardo. He is well known in the field of social psychology. And you may recall that we talked about him when we talked about the prison study. So he is the person that actually designed that prison study early in his career at, uh, at Stanford. But the point here is Ivan Pavlov and, and this process that he described. I'm sure people have you know, observed this thing for many, many years, you know, that you can create these associations, but, but we codified it and put it into psychology and it's, it's actually quite important. So when I describe a classical conditioning model, I use something like what you see here. So um, during the conditioning, as you can see, the NS and the UCS are presented the NS slightly before the UCS, and the reaction that we have is the UCR. Now, after a period of time of pairing the NS and the UCS, um, we're, we're going to have uh, the CS alone elicit the CR. So the CS elicits the, con the condition stance, elicits the condition reinforcement without food. Now, as Pavlov described, after a period of time where there's no food, I mean, I, I think Zimbardo described it, um, then extinction will occur. And that's a term that we'll get to later on. So now let's look at um, Little Albert. Little Albert was a subject of John Watts, uh, Watson. John Watson was a researcher, very interested in behaviorism. That's whose quote I had at the beginning. And he worked with a baby named Little Albert. 
And so I'd like to uh, conclude today's lesson by showing you a video of little Albert. Behavior of animals and humans alike. To study the power of conditioning, Watson used infants as subjects, as you can see in this original footage from the 1920s. Watson showed that strong emotions could be learned in one situation by conditioning and then generalized, that is, transferred to other similar situations without having to repeat the original conditioning. Watson and his assistant, Rosalie Reyna, conditioned the infants to fear a white rat they had liked at first. In this case, they worked with an eight-month-old called Little Albert. Each time the rat was presented, a loud gong was struck, startling the infant. Soon the appearance of the rat alone was enough to make him cry and become fearful. This was classical conditioning at work. When the child crawled away from the rat towards safety, her behavior was rewarded in that her fear was reduced. Instrumental conditioning was now at work. Later, when the children saw any stimulus that was similar to the rat, a rabbit, a dog, a fur coat, a mask, their learned fear was generalized to all of them. The once fearless children were now easily frightened by a host of harmless things. Watson's pioneering study was controversial because of the way he used children. Such an experiment could not be conducted today because of strict ethical guidelines governing the treatment of all research subjects, humans and animals. A few years after the demonstrations, an associate of Watson, Mary Cover Jones, developed techniques for removing naturally conditioned fears in youngsters. Jones was the first behavior therapist. But these techniques came too late for some of Watson's subjects. Little Albert's fate remains unknown. Okay, so um, remind me in class, when you guys are in class, to let you know what actually did happen to little Albert. A couple of years ago, his fate was actually um, figured out. And um, I do want to say that uh, what John Watson did was certainly not acceptable. Uh, by modern day standards to use a child without the um, parental permission. So for your assignment, I'd like you to see, remember there are two stimuli, okay? See if you can figure out what the two stimuli are. F see if you can figure out what the unconditioned response was, what the unconditioned stimulus was that elicited that, what the conditioned stimulus was and what the conditioned response was. And then the final question, is how did the fear generalize? In other words, uh, generalization we'll talk about later, but generalization is when the learned response is spread to other similar kinds of stimuli. So that's enough for today. I know that's been a pretty long lesson. This is going to be your ABA to answer that question. Um, please see if you can do it on your own. I know that you can look it up online. That's, you know, really, really easy to do um, because his study is so famous. But I'm just asking you to try to do it on your own because I'm not going to grade it for if you're right or not. I just want to see that you've attempted it. So have a great day. We will continue classical conditioning. It's a, it's a great topic. All right. Thank you. Bye.